let's talk a little bit. Um, first of all, thank you both for your presentations. And is it possible to train artificial intelligence to be good to begin with? Who wants to take a shot at that? I think you first need to find what good means. <laughs> we would I need mean, a philosopher. Well, I mean, probably to would, really what is good. What is good? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we knows? heard we heard the gentleman from Facebook at the beginning um, of the afternoon session saying that it was important to um, use artificial intelligence to, to to train you know their their software to make the right decisions. Yeah. So I think, is, is it more of an ethics question or is it um, a question of technology? Uh, I think the first thing that we have to keep in mind that um, it's a very hard task to train an algorithm to be good if the world isn't good. And I think this is where the problem starts. The most, most of the problems that we see with um, algorithmic decision making are biases and discrimination. And the bias comes from the data. And the data is inherently biased because we are inherently biased, right? So what algorithms do is they just force us to look into a mirror, right? Right. And they show us the, how it is. So you can do two things, right? You can start tweaking the algorithm and make it look less biased, but you're not going to change the underlying problem that is in the world, right? You can use algorithm decision making to get rid of certain biases, but at the same time, you would actually need to change the social structure that we have in society. So it's not just a technical solution. It has to be something that is more deeply grounded. Well, uh, I would actually really say it's uh, way more an ethical kind of problem, uh, a problem where our society as a whole has to discuss and to agree upon what kind of uh, values we have uh, in this age of digitization and how we would design our machines uh, but don't we, to conform don't, with that. Don't we already have the, haven't we already agreed on what those values are? Well, I don't think so. Um, look at what's going on in politics right now. Uh, huge division between different political camps. Uh, there is no agreement there. And this is about basic sort of human rights. No agreement there. Uh, do we have it? I don't think so. And, and really, like now that machines are beginning to take over cognitive processing, and now that machines are beginning to come up with decisions for us, to assist us, maybe even to replace us. This is really a social issue we need to discuss as a society at large. Once there is a form of agreement there, I guess it would be possible to design the systems accordingly. You've spoken with, um, I think you were invited by the German Chancellor to come in and talk about yep. artificial intelligence. Yep. Did this subject come up with her about you know, society and, and our notion of good and bad and how it plays the in? The question that uh, always pops up immediately is privacy. Is all of this progress possible while at the same time um, keeping privacy awareness? Yeah, that, that question came up there. Um, but the, the need for a discussion that also involves philosophers, sociologists, lawyers, not just uh, technical people such as me. Um, everybody recognizes that, and I really hope that it'll start soon, because, I mean, in, in, uh, in the UK, you're farther ahead. You do have the Institute for the Future of Humanities. We don't have that in Germany yet, but we need that decision, uh, this discussion. And is, is that something that's going to be done at a nation st state level, or is this, because the technology it transcends national boundaries. Um, I guess, I mean, to a certain degree, I would, I would, to a certain extent, I would agree that we probably don't have a set shared of values that we all agree You agree upon. with that? Yeah, I don't think we have that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either, because values change over time, right? A lot of things that we consider Unethical now weren't unethical 200 years ago or 15 years ago, right? Yeah. Things are changing, and usually change is not necessarily a, a bad thing, right? So it just means that you don't have 
a binary answer to what's good or what's bad. It will completely depend on the context rather mm -hmm. than having a framework that is timeless and will always be applicable. Of course, you can agree on like abstract principles like fairness and justice, but like what that actually means in practice will change drastically over time and depending on the application. And it will, it will differ from region to region to region in the world. Right? This is, we are now probably assuming a very sort of say central European perspective on what is good or bad. Yeah. And that might be different in other parts of well, the world. Well, let, let's ask the audience, maybe just for a show of hands. Do, do you think that there is a, a shared system of values around the world? In other words, do you think that all of us agree on what is good and what is not good? There's not anyone who believes that. So that means then we're, we really have a lot of work to do, yeah. right? I guess, but still, like even, even though we don't have complete consensus over everything, I think um, institutions like the European Union could actually make a difference if we you know, come together and think about what's important, right? And have a counterweight. Because I think being fragmented, that would actually harm more than it would benefit. Do you think, right? do, you're, you're in the UK, right? Yeah. So do you, do you think Brexit has that, has that um, made things, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, you have to take that question. That still hurts, by the way. Uh, does right? it still hurt? Yeah, yeah, it does still hurt. But what does that do to the, the notion of the, looking at the European Union as yeah. a guide for helping us, you know, reach a consensus? Yeah. I mean, again, like. <laughs> you can just tell how you feel. I think Brexit is the biggest mistake ever. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that's but, just my opinion. Um, how this will play out, I don't know. Um, I still hope that the UK will remain a good relationship with the European Union. And looking at the politics that they're doing right there, you can see that the House of Commons, House of Lords, they all have issued um, reports recently saying that they want to be an ethical leader when it comes to AI. They have a new council now. They're trying to come up with guidance for industry to allow them or to incentivize them to be more ethical with their applications. So I, I still feel like that there is um, a will there to do that, actually. Yeah. Um, I still think that I can also see this on the European level, but it just will depend how it actually works out because I don't think yet another framework that tells you don't do evil will do the trick. Yeah. You would actually have to have like clear guidance to tell somebody, you know, do this and don't do that. Yeah, maybe it's actually easier to turn the question upside down. Is it possible to train AI to be bad? For sure, right? You can use AI in uh, weapon systems and you can have these weapon systems to be very aggressive. You can definitely teach AI to do that. You can use AI as a tool uh, for internet crime, cyber crime. You can train AI systems to break into other people's computers and so on. So it's no problem whatsoever to have artificial intelligence that's really bad. And but the it, question could be, yeah. do we want that? But, or is there sort of an exclusion principle? Like we agree as a society on the European or national or international level on what AI is not supposed to do. And everybody who uses it for these purposes is a rogue guy. So it's and we would sort of e exclude the bad thing. It's easier to, d to agree on what um, is, is bad that it is to agree on what is good, is what you're I'm, saying. I'm not even sure if that's true. Like in my personal opinion, one of the applications where I think we probably shouldn't use AI are autom uh, autonomous weapon systems and predictive yeah. policing, right? Yeah. Or algorithms used in criminal justice altogether. And there are vastly, vastly differing opinions around the world. And you won't find any consensus there. You even find people that say autonomous weapon systems are more ethical. Mm. Then not I have a really hard time understanding you. I, I don't, maybe it's the microphone. Oh, yeah, the acoustics away. is bad. Okay. Is uh, it? Uh, uh, yeah. Is that yeah. better? No, it's, it's, it's not. It's not you. you oh. Your voice is fine. There's just the, okay. the acoustics. Let's do a little. Um, but 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 for instance, yeah. like China is now famous for having these social credits, right? And yes. There's lots of face detection going on in China, public surveillance, stuff that hasn't been going on uh, prior to 2015. These things are new. They are largely based on AI, and I, for one, 
wouldn't want to live in a country like that. But does everyone and know so about, what, about what's going on in China? That there is a city in China now, I think the population is about a quarter of a million, where everyone is being watched 24 seven, and they are given plus and minus points for their behavior, their social behavior. And then they're rewarded for that as well um, by getting access to public facilities or being denied access. <clears throat> and everyone in the city has consented to being a part of this. Or, I mean, consent, of course, is, is a very, you know, I don't know what consent means in China, but everyone is doing it voluntarily. So, yeah, you're right. That's, that's an example of where AI can turn the state into Big Brother. Yeah. Let me do a flash poll and ask everyone, um, of the following five institutions, which do you think would be the best in helping us um, come to a consensus on what would be good for artificial intelligence? Germany, the UK, the US, the EU, or the UN? So let's start with how many people think Germany is the place where we could look to to get those values and consensus? No one. How about the UK? How about the United States? There's one, two. How about the European Union? That's a lot. How about the United Nations? So uh, that's, that's almost 50-50 for the EU, right. And, and the reason I ask that is because we, we see today outside of AI, we see a, an attack coming from everywhere on supranational institutions, right? You see it on the EU, you see it on the UN. Um, and yet when you ask this audience where they think we could, we could get the moral authority to, to come to a consensus, it is those supranational bodies. Yeah. So what do we do then? I mean, I feel like it's, it's not just like um, wishful thinking. Like in terms of data protection, I think we just have shown that Europe is leading the way, right? With the new framework with the GDPR that is now in force, yeah. that has applicability um, beyond the borders of the European Union, all of a sudden everybody's looking at Europe how to handle data in an ethical way, right? People are actually adopting their processes because they know they would lose Europe as a business partner if they don't comply. Right. So this is not just, okay, you know, um, in a theory thing, it's actually something that will happen in practice. And I think a similar thing could happen with AI as well. I'm not convinced that you would need to have like an AI law, but what we would need to do is actually look at the frameworks that are applicable in a certain sector and see if this is doing the trick if algorithms are being used as well, right? Okay. And then you can have a discussion whether you need to extend those laws to algorithmic systems or if you need new laws to govern the novel risks. Christian, what do you think? We do need to have supernatural national consensus. This is really not, not a thing that could be done by one country uh, at a time. Uh, there needs to be a solution either put forth by the EU or put forth by the United Nations. Of course, the bigger the institution is, the harder it is to get consensus, the more right. uh, diversity there is. Um, I guess it's probably a good place to start to come up with a European idea as to what we want to have right now, how far we want to go right now, uh, where we do not want to go as uh, people in Europe. And maybe, yeah, maybe that could be a beacon for the rest of the world. But again, like um, in some places of the world, AI is perfectly fine if it makes you a lot of money and nobody cares about you know, what it really does as long as it makes money. In other places of the world, it's perfectly fine to have AI to you know, really streamline your society. And maybe in Europe, neither of these things is okay, but we need that discussion. And you said that when you were talking with the chancellor that the notion of privacy comes up, yeah. data protection. And, and Europe currently has what is considered the standard bearer yeah. um, in data protection. Yeah. Um, you, you have that here in Europe. You, you have maybe the United States where you, you don't have that um, attention to data protection. Yeah. And then you have another extreme, which is China. Um, where the notion of data protection basically is non-existent. So 
we've got we've got kind of three models working here, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Is is it a competition of three models? Um, so I yes, think. So. I totally agree that the notion of the value of privacy vastly differs between the US and the European the US and the European Union. We vastly difference between Germany and the UK, like right. a part Germany, part German, part Austrian. When yeah. I moved there, their attitude to privacy is staggering, right? London has more <laughs> cameras and has people living there. Right. Everybody's fine with that, right? Yeah. It's just a completely different um, attitude towards it mainly because they have more trust in the government than we have, yeah. right? So that's yeah. just a historical, cultural difference. <clears throat> and of course, the US has a very self-regulatory, less affair, no regulation approach. Interestingly, though, and I think that was true probably until, I don't know, three months ago? Yeah. Because since Facebook happened, everybody's like, oh, we need data protection. Yeah. So all of a sudden, even the Americans are like, oh my god, maybe we should look at Europe and look at what they're doing. Because I feel like once people feel the pain, and I think with Facebook, we felt the pain, now things are maybe changing in terms of the attitude and protection. Is, is Facebook but, but, that important as well? Um, maybe so, let, me, let me interject yeah? something else. It's actually, it is really always more complicated than it appears at first sight. Uh, for instance, uh, now with the European privacy and data protection uh, framework in place, it has become even more difficult to work with medical data because uh, the guiding principle is to sort of safeguard the patient against exploitation. However, in the US, for instance, it's way easier to collect medical data across the country from different hospitals. And using this medical data, terabytes and terabytes about medical data, illnesses and sicknesses and treatments and so on, and then run data analysis on these kind of data, you come up with new cures. And this is great. Once you find them, you patent them, you print money. Right. These are things that are now blocked in Europe. This is, I completely disagree. I couldn't disagree more. If you look at what the GDPR actually says, it's encouraging medical research. First of all, we now have a provision that allows broad consent rather than informed consent. So far, it has been the case that you have to consent to every data processing um, activity, and there was no way of reusing the data. Now, in terms of medical research, we have broad consent. So you could actually give your data to a researcher and allow them to have further studies if there is something interesting coming up. There are at least two other provisions. I think it's Article 89 in the GDPR that says that a lot of the hard law regulation stuff doesn't apply if it is for medical research. So this is absolutely not true. I'm glad to hear that. I just wanted to point out that uh, there always is a trade-off. Yeah, of course. And, and we try to over or, or tend to overlook that uh, there's always two sides to the coin. Yes, right? but and this is exactly what the framework does. You have, for example, the right to withdraw consent, to delete your data, um, to rectify your data. All of these things can be overruled if it's for the purpose of medical research. This is explicitly mentioned in the law. This is something that was very important for European legislators to make medical research more efficient. Okay, so you're not saying that the, the, the new law is a hindrance to no. medical research? I think it's supporting it. Okay, okay, that, that's good to know. Let me pick up on the Facebook, the topic of Facebook again. How many people here um, are active users of Facebook? And you don't have to be ashamed. We're not taking pictures. So I would. What, what is that? Raise your hands again. Come on, don't be ashamed. So it's well, that's not a lot, is it? Uh, maybe the demographics are younger here. That maybe that's why. Right. Um, but the the argument has been made that Facebook is going to take the European data protection law and apply that globally with its company. And by doing that, it's going to actually act as um, a catalyst to getting the, a global consensus on data protection, which maybe is our way of, which helps us to understand maybe using AI the same way. Do you guys believe that? But it changed that now again, right? Well, that's what they said, yeah. No, no, no they they explicitly excluded everybody that is not a user in the European Union from the benefits of the GDPR, right? Before the whole scandal happened, I think it was before Mark Zuckerberg said that he 
agrees with the spirit of GDPR right. and is working on ideas of how to make it globally applicable, whatever that means, whatever agreeance and agreement in spirit means. So from a legal perspective, what happened was like everything, every user in Canada and the US is being served from, from the US, so they don't have any GDPR claims. Right. The rest of the world is being served from, from Europe, from Ireland. According to the framework, whenever data processing happens in a European country, the GDPR is applicable. Yes. So what they did now is use change the terms of services so the countries outside of the European Union wouldn't have those rights anymore. So this is what agreement in spirit means. So in other words, when Facebook tells us that they want to apply the data protection rules from Europe to the rest of the world, they're, not be they're, they're being disingenuous. Yeah, they changed the terms and conditions, right? It's, right? it's no longer applicable. It's only applicable to the people that are in Europe, right? Not outside of Europe. So, when, and, and I'm just thinking about this in, in a, a per public perception manner. If we see a, a company like Facebook doing this, mm -hmm. then how are we ever going to, to build the trust that is necessary in order to reach a consensus on artificial intelligence? I mean, how, how does that happen? Yeah, I, I think it's a good question. And I, I actually, I was very hopeful um, that that wouldn't happen and that actually the data protection would be taken seriously. And I don't know, like, this is, this is the question. You could also have a discussion whether the, the, the change of uses of services was actually legal, right? And then go in with that argument and try to fight right. it, right? And I think the jury is still out on that yeah. anyway. And like, as I said, I think, Regulation is not always the only and the best answer, right? But only trusting on the ethical conscience of companies might not do the trick either. Right. So I think, especially with what happened there, you would have hoped that they want to be a leader in data protection now. So there's the question, like, how much is enough to say we're giving incentives to do the right thing? And when is it, when did you cross that line and we say, well, you actually know we're going to regulate? Right. Okay. Question could be like um, most of what we have seen in the last couple of years was driven by the private sector, and for understandable reasons, uh, they are the ones who have all the data because they collected it for decades. Uh, they are the ones who have all the compute power because they use it to run their services anyway. Yeah. Um, but maybe we need some public institutions that sort of join the party. Uh, for instance, uh, in large parts of Europe. Edu education is something we do not delegate to companies. That is something we sort of think is, is the duty of, I don't know, a well-run government. Uh, certain things are better if they are public. Yeah, yeah. so I have to agree, disagree again, because we do have those institutions. We have data protection authorities in the member states. No, no, and they I, I, was, I, no, was, no, talking, they I was not talking about data protection. I was talking about institutions that develop and deploy AI. And the problem there is that right now, this is mainly business institutions or the military yeah. or the spy agencies. And uh, it probably would be better for the general attitude towards what is happening right now if trusted public institutions were to join this party. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, largely a question of money and resources, yeah. but the, the sort of negative trend we might, if we would want to, recognize right now is because what's going on right now is driven by companies or governments we do not totally agree with. Yeah. yeah so the, I think the funding problem is legit, right? So a lot of the research is now being done by companies who have like the best experts, the best resources, the best expertise to actually develop those systems. And a lot of people from university just get straight up recruited to work at Google, and they have very attractive offers. I mean, if you look at, you're never going to be rich if you stay in academia, right? And that's, that's one of the problems, that it just attracts the good people to go to more promising um, uh, companies. So I get that, and I think there has to be something to be done in terms of having public funding avail available for universities. Yeah. In terms of, of regulation, um, 
So we do, we do have authorities that would actually have the power to do something. The problem is that they very often don't do, right? So with the Facebook example, everybody is super shocked that that actually happened. How can it be possible that Facebook is giving third party access to almost everybody? Max Schrems launched a lawsuit in 2011. Yeah, that's right. Saying that this is happening, urging them to do something, and nothing was done. Yeah. So it's not just about having new regulatory institutions, which I'm not even sure we do have. I think it's important that the ones that we do have act accordingly if something is flagged up. Yeah. We've got um, about seven minutes. Um, any questions from the audience? Because um, we've, we've got the time. Does anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to share? No one? This gentleman right here at the front. Do we have a microphone for the gentleman? <clears throat> right here. <clears throat> Can everyone hear us okay in the back? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. sorry to... Can everyone hear me? Okay. It's all right. Um, so in terms of making sure uh, the, um, how AI algorithms uh, do what they're supposed to be doing uh, in terms of uh, having an outside party, say, for example, lawyers, um, to validate what, what an AI is doing, what sort of things w would you be looking for uh, as to how the AI go goes about its, its decision-making process mm -hmm. to, so make to, to, to make sure that it's complying with the law? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I think there are a couple of things that you could do. I think first we should actually have a very good discussion with industry to encourage them to come up with certain standards, right? Because at the moment we don't really have like standard agreement of how those systems are being developed. We should encourage them to test those systems before they're actually being deployed. And I think there's a lot of things that can be done without actually walking in and regulating anything. I think another thing that is still though important is that we should also have some kind of ex post control. That means if a system fails, if you feel discriminated, that you can go to somebody that then has the power to investigate further. So if you feel like that an algorithm has discriminated against you and you have been filtered out because you're a woman, then you should have somebody who could go in and investigate on your behalf. So this could be a data protection agency, this could be an NGO um, that could have like a mediating role trying to figure out what went wrong. It doesn't need to be that the company was doing something bad on purpose, but I think it's important that they have some kind of middleman that tries to resolve the issue. And I think that's something that would be sensible. Um, for instance, if you were to build your own car from scratch, you know, using stuff you find somewhere, build it together, uh, you would not be allowed, at least in Central Europe, to drive that car on the street. You have to have it uh, technologically certified by institutions that make sure that it meets all the security uh, regulations and whatever. And when it comes to AI, we don't have that yet. And that's, again, perfectly understandable because this is in its current state fairly new technology and we don't even know how to uh, have official guidelines for how it is supposed to work and, and how it's not supposed to work and what to do and what not. But we should begin to think about certificates for the quality of AI systems, which could be tested before AI systems are deployed in practice. And this is definitely a process that will not happen overnight. Again, that needs discussion and expert hearings and all these kind of things. But maybe it is the point in time to be thinking about that at least. Like just as, for instance, you would have to do with your car. Yeah, good point. Any other questions? We've got a gentleman here. It's, it's really loud up here, isn't it? Go ahead. It's not on. It's not on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is it, oh, nice. Um, question is for Christian. And I, can you speak up? I really up. can't okay, hear I'm a single sorry. word. Can you hear me? Can you understand me now? Or um, Can you understand it? No. Oh, 
Uh, um, speak up. Uh, okay, um, this question is for Christian Baukage. Um, Sandra Wachter um, said something about, uh, uh, said that it's uh, technically possible um, to tell the um, end user about the um, automatic processing that happened, uh, that was, um, happened because of the uh, I, I so the so the question is like I said you can explain stuff yeah. he said he can't no, and that's the question. You, you said that you it's explainable and I would uh, um, enjoy it if I appreciate it if um, Baukage could um, make a statement about that. Um, is it actually technically possible to give an explanation? And um, what do you think? Um, she said that the um, background processes that make decisions uh, that I makes the decisions with um, are possible to explain to the end user. Um, what do you think about it? Is it actually possible or what is your technical opinion on that? It, it is definitely possible. Okay. Very difficult with these so-called connectionist architectures, these neural networks that are currently dominating uh, many areas. There it's really, really difficult, but not impossible. There is a lot of research going on right now for how to make uh, these kind of things more transparent and explainable to the end user, but uh, there are also completely different ideas for how to realize deep decision-making systems that work well because they are deep, but completely different from, from this dominant paradigm of neural networks right now um, to, for instance, uh, assemble them together out of little building blocks where it is obvious what each of these building blocks does. And uh, this is alternative research, different approach to, to AI, uh, something we're working on right now, for instance. Um, this, is, this is very much ongoing research, totally possible, but not off-the-shelf technology yet, in, so in either case. In like ex counterfactual explanations you could actually use in neural networks and in highly complex systems. You can compute them and it's actually quite easy and it's not, um, it doesn't require a lot of computing power. I and would be generally rather careful with respect to these things. I know you have worked on that, but to yeah. so we sort tested of state it with that, two data that sets. generally is, is a bit of probably overly optimistic. So we did test it with two data sets. Um, one was on health and the other one was on um, scores for entry scores for law school. Um, and yeah, if you want to have a look at that, like there is a way of doing that. It doesn't mean you explain everything that the algorithm does, but it tells you the most important thing that you're actually interested in. OK. OK. Um, we're at the end of our time, actually. Thank you very much to both of you, Christian and Sandra. Let's give them a round of applause. It was a really good discussion. Thank you both.